Okay, so here's our agenda for today. We'll, I'll be spending about 30 to 40 minutes talking about these things. We're going to start talking about your learning environment, then go more into productivity and habit formation, and then into mindset for learning effectively. But that doesn't mean that we're not talking about working remotely because a lot of the things that we'll be talking about in, from a learning perspective also apply to working remotely. But towards the end, we'll also focus about productivity in working remotely. And then hopefully we'll have about 15 or 20 minutes uh, space open for Q&A. So without much ado, let's get started. So let's start with setting up your learning environment, which I think is one of the most important uh, parts of setting yourself up for success to learn effectively remotely. So first of all, just because you're learning remotely doesn't mean that everything is remote. You are going to learn from somewhere and that somewhere should be a dedicated space for learning. Uh, research says that even though we are not going to the office or we are not going to the university, to have a dedicated space in your home for learning really helps with learning productivity. So for, if it's possible, it should be a separate room. Uh, it could be a home office space or it, it should at least be a dedicated desk space in your home. It's highly recommended that it should be away from your bedroom where you sleep because otherwise sleep is going to distract you from productivity or else if that is not possible, definitely make sure that your desk faces away from your bed. That helps, really helps in you mentally blocking out the space in your home so that you know that when you're sitting on this chair and this desk, you're ready to learn. So that's why it's very important to have a dedicated space for learning. Also, it's important to personalize this learning space. <clears throat> and what that means is, Turn it into a place that you truly love being in. Decorate it with what really means important to you, like add a plant over there or, or keep your favorite books in front. Or if you're somebody who really likes a clean and organized space, clean and organize it in such a way that whenever you sit in this space, it is all about you and you feel like you are set up for success. Moving on from there to the actual digital space where you will be working, which is on your computer, on your browsers, on your learning environment, it's very important that you even create some separation over there. Uh, we use our computers for a lot of things, not just learn and work, but also our entertainment. But it's really important that we can separate that digital space. So some quick pro tips on that are, um, if you use a Google Chrome browser, you can actually create separate profiles on Chrome. So you can have one profile for your personal work and you can have one profile for your professional work. So that way, whenever you're in your professional space, you won't be distracted by anything that you do in your personal time. So just like you create separations in your physical environment, you can create separations in your digital space. And also it's very important that before you get started, you really look into the right digital tools to set yourself up for success. And there's no, you, there's no cookie cutter solution or one solution fits all for this. Everyone aligns with different digital tools. So it's very important you do your research and find out what's out there and what really works for you. As I was saying, create a separate profile for learning on your, uh, on your computer operating system itself. If you're using Windows, you can create separate user profiles or on your browser to make sure you know when you're learning. Um, like I was talking about digital tools, you can look at tools like Evernote or Notion, which really help with uh, note taking and organizing your work, like daily planning, uh, reflection on your work, journaling. Uh, also make sure you look at some really good calendar apps that help you set up your weekly routines, not just for yourself, but also for the people you learn with or work with. You can have shared calendars as well. So there are lots of tools out there and it's not very easy to explain the features of all the tools but make sure whatever tools you choose, you really dive deep into them and find what are the features. There are so many hidden features out there that have been developed for us to work effectively in a remote environment. And make sure that you keep these tools easily accessible. Keep them on the home screen of your phone or keep them on, your, um, on the desktop space of your laptop so that you can easily access them. Uh, keep bookmarks to essential tools or essential links that help you get productive. But 
But just because we are talking more and more about the digital doesn't mean we forget the old school good tools like a pin board um, where you can pin up things that are really important to you or that you need to remember or use sticky notes uh, on, your desk, on your desk space to remember what you are working on or just a diary or journal. You don't always have to take notes digitally. If it works, if pen and paper works for you, then go for it. Um, one specific method I would like to talk about, which is which is not exactly a digital method. I don't know if you have heard about this, but it's called the bullet journal method. Uh, it was created by this person called Ryder Carroll, who actually, I think, um, was struggling with ADHD, uh, attention deficit hyper disorder, where he was a highly productive person, but he really found it hard to focus on everything at once. And it's a huge misconception that those with ADHD cannot focus on one thing. Sometimes it's actually that they are focusing on 10 things and it's, help, and it's making things hard for them. And these days in the, in, when working or learning remotely, even we are doing more than one thing at a time. We are probably uh, taking care of our family or our, or our children uh, while also sitting in our space and trying to learn. So the bullet journal method is actually a journaling method, which really helps you become more mindful with your productivity. Uh, it helps you track three things, especially. What have I accomplished so far? What do I need to do today? And what goals am I working towards in the future? It's like a culmination of your past, present, and future to help you stay mindful. So we all set goals whenever we are learning or working and goals are important for a direction, but it's the systems that will actually help you make progress towards your goals. So do explore this method called the bullet journaling method. Um, disclaimer, if you, if you Google for this on the internet, you will find some very creative and colorful bullet journals because the, because the practice has really evolved in that sense that people just not only journal, but they, they have turned it into a creativity practice. So so if that is your calling and you like, uh, you know, colorful journaling, go for it. But it doesn't mean it has to be that way. If you, if you look for what Ryder Carroll himself does in his bullet journal, it's a very minimal setup and you'll see that it really helps with productivity. So with that, moving on to what is productivity and how do we get productive? So the first and most important thing about productivity is to make sure that you are able to declutter your mind. Till your mind is cluttered and worried and stressed, you will not be able to get into a productive space. So it's very important that you get rid of your stress, you, you get clarity on what you need to do, and you establish a sense of control. Big things, but how do we do this, you might be wondering. So it's all about self-reflection in the end. The best way to declutter your mind is to understand your mind. And that means to really ask yourself some questions, like, what is my preferred learning style? Um, some people say they are visual learners. Some people say they're auditory learners. Some people think they are kinesthetic learners. They like to get things done with their hands. So everybody has a preferred learning style. When it comes to learning remotely, some people love reading blogs and tutorials, whereas others don't have the attention to read, but they would love, what, love to watch a video about the same topic. So it's all about trying different things, asking yourself, finding out what is your preferred learning style. Along with that, what is the best time of the day when you feel focused? That's, that's very important. Some, some are early morning birds, uh, the 5 a.m. club folks, and some are night owls who really get at it probably after 10 p.m., 11 p.m. So no judgment there, there's no right or wrong, but you need to know what is the best time of the day where you feel the most focused. Also, how long can you stay focused? Some people can really dive into deep learning and deep work. In their most productive time, they can probably be at it for two hours, three hours at a stretch. But some people find that after 20 minutes, they lose their attention, which is totally fine. You need to know who you are and what works for you so that you are never pushing yourself in a direction that does not make sense for you. Along with that, what brings you joy and what makes you calm? Both are very important when you're learning. You need to enjoy what you're learning. And you also need to be calm when you're, when you're tackling something very difficult. So some people like to meditate. Some people like to pray. Some people like to 
uh, listen to music. You need to know what works for you to get you in a calm space so that you're ready for learning. And most importantly, when do I need a break? Nobody can learn forever. You need to know that if you need a break in 20 minutes, you need a break. But if you can go on for one hour, you take a break at one hour. But you end of the day, it's all about what works most for you. That is what helps in decluttering your mind. Secondly, when it comes to learning, there's so much out there to learn. What do we learn and what do we don't not learn? Uh, that's when bucket lists come in. Of course, nobody can learn everything out there. So it's really important that you create a bucket list of what matters to you. And not an endless bucket list. They say three is the magic number. Start with the top three things you really want to learn in the next three months. And one of them could be really related to what you already do or what, what you already are studying so that it isn't the most challenging one. It is, it is more of an easier one. So let's say you're already studying uh, coding and you want to learn a particular programming language. Then one of them or two of them should be something different from what you are already doing so that you're able to push your brain in further directions and expand your thinking and knowledge. So going with the same example, maybe you're a coder, but you want to learn a new dance form. So completely different from what you do. So try to make a list of top three things that matter to you and look at it from the perspective of how will this help me? What will this enable me to do? Am I enjoying this? This, that one is very important because often when it comes to learning, we fall into the trap of peer pressure just because our friends or our family or, or our colleagues are learning something we think we should be learning it too. But is this going to help you? Is this going to bring you joy? If not, then you don't need to do it just because others are doing it. So these self-reflection, reflecting questions are very important. Also, when you have made up a list of learning things, you need to prioritize them. What will I tackle first? And what is the ideal timeline for this? That's about self-accountability. You need to set a, a deadline for yourself so that you are accountable to yourself to check off the items on your bucket list. Moving on from there, and as we talk more and more about productivity, I hope you all have either heard of or felt this flow state. Uh, it's, you know, when you really feel in the zone, you've sat down to study something or work on something, and you've just completely lost track of time. You, you don't even know where you are anymore. You are so focused and so into what you're doing. This is called flow, and this happens to everyone. And if you look at this graph here, it, it, it explains very well when flow happens. So they say that if your skill level is proportional to the challenge at hand, then you will feel flow. Versus if your skill is higher than your challenge, you will find, end up feeling bored. So let's say I get a very seasoned football player to just kick a ball on the wall. Uh, he or she is going to feel bored, right? Because their skill is much higher than what the challenge is. Versus if I get somebody who knows nothing about football to suddenly do a, a, a crazy headbutt goalpost, it's very tough for them. It will make them feel anxious. So Whenever you sit down to learn something and you will be challenging yourself as you grow through your learning journey, always try to see, is my skill growing with the challenge? And is the challenge growing as my skill is developing? As long as you can keep these two balanced, whenever you sit down to learn, you will see that you're getting into that flow state. Uh, this one is a funny one. <laughs> you might be thinking, what? Productive procrastination? They said procrastination is bad. But here's the honest truth. Nobody can stay motivated and productive at all times. That's, that's just Superman. And nobody is Superman. So there's this unknown concept that people don't know that procrastination does not always have to be unproductive. As long as you don't endlessly procrastinate. So sometimes you might have a very large task at hand, but you just don't have the mental space or energy to tackle it right away. So you, during these times, you can still push yourself to do some other low priority or low productivity tasks. One very easy example over there is, let's say I have to write a project report, but I just can't get to it. Okay, I'm gonna clean my room or let me go do the dishes or let me go help my kid with his homework. 
So it's not exactly the task that I need to do, but I'm still not procrastinating by doing something completely unproductive, like spending time on social media or, or just lazing around. So what this does is in the back of your mind, you still know that you have a high priority task at hand. And because you're still doing other important tasks, even though low in priority, it helps you stay focused and it prepares you to get over that procrastination. So let's say you're done with doing cleaning the room. It's so clean and organized now. You'll feel like, okay, let's get to the task. Let's get it, let's get it done. So whenever you're feeling unmotivated, unprepared for a high task, you can always try and do productive procrastination. But make sure you're not procrastinating endlessly because end of the day, you got to get that task done. So that's pretty much it on productivity. But moving on from there, I really want to talk about habit formation, which I think is very essential to learning and working. First of all, understanding habits and our habits. So um, I don't know if you've read this amazing book called The Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's really changed my life and a lot of people's life out there, I, I believe. So he says that success is not a one, once in a lifetime transformation. It's not that something suddenly happens to you and you change overnight. It's actually the product of daily small habits, a buildup of those. So to understand our habits, you will notice that all habits follow this common loop called the Q-routine reward loop or the Q-routine reward cycle. So let's say somebody who has the habit of going for a jog in the morning. Their cue is they wake up in the morning, they go out to their living room and they see their jogging shoes ready. The moment they see it, something happens in the brain. And by the way, if you're really interested in what happens in the brain, they say there's a part of the brain called the basal ganglia where all our habits are stored. So the moment you see that cue, that thing triggers in your brain, which tells you it's time to go for a run. So you wear your shoes. That means your, your routine starts. You wear your shoes, you wear your joggers, you're getting ready to get out there. You probably put on your earphones to listen to some good music while running. And you go for the run, which is the routine. And once you come back from your run, you're sweating, you're feeling strong, you're feeling energized. That's the reward. Um, you, you are getting a release of endorphins or feel-good hormones in your brain. This is what happens with every habit that we have. Good habits, bad habits, it's always the same thing. It's the cue that really triggers you and you get into the routine and then you get into the reward. In order to learn effectively, you need to build habits for learning. So let's say I sign up to a six month course on Coursera. I won't be able to succeed if I don't build a habit of sitting down to study every day. Or if I join a coding bootcamp, I won't be able to succeed if I don't build a habit of writing some code every day. So habits are very important to be able to learn effectively remotely. And in order to understand and build your habits, you need to first analyze your habits. You need to see what are your cues and your rewards. And you'll find there are some if you really reflect. Something that really helps uh, and which is suggested in this book by James Clear is to make a habit scorecard. So go through your daily routine. Just write down every little habit that you have, or if not to the minutest detail, at least to some level of detail, what are the different habits that I follow through in the day? and then turn it into a scorecard. If you think your habit helps you get productive, put a plus one next to it. If you think your habit reduces your productivity, put a minus one next to it. And there might be some neutral habits, like let's say brushing my teeth, maybe that doesn't really help me get productive, but it is not a bad habit either, it's a good habit. So maybe I won't put any score next to it. But once you do this, tally your total, and then you will see in the day, do you have more productive habits or do you have habits that are hindering you from your productivity? And then ask yourself, what is at least one habit that I can change? Once you've identified a habit that you want to change or a habit that you want to build newly, it's all about once again, the Q routine reward. They say the best way to go about it is don't change the Q, don't change the reward, just replace the routine. So let's say um, whenever I look at my phone, 
I have the urge to browse through social media. So I can't throw my phone away. I can't put the queue out, right? I'm always going to have that queue there. But what if I replace it with a different routine? Whenever I look at my phone, how about I go to my favorite blog site and read the first blog post over there? And I'm learning something new there. So let's say I'm, I'm trying to learn about design. So maybe I can follow good design bloggers. And whenever in the day I'm looking at my phone, I open those blog, blog posts and I read a new blog. You will see that at first it is difficult, but as you keep for, forcing yourself to do the different routine, you will still get the same reward that you used to get from your earlier poorer habit. That's how your brain recalibrates. Another way to do it is try habit stacking. Um, if you already have one really good habit, add on your existing, your new habit to this existing habit. So let's say um, I, let's go with the running example again. I really like to go for a run or a jog every morning. How about while I do that, I listen to a podcast or I listen to an audio book. So I'm building a new habit on top of an existing habit. I know no matter what, I'll go for a run. But if I force myself to also listen to audiobooks during that time, I'm making a new habit and making the most of that time. And if it's really hard to find what's a good habit to put me into that productivity mindset, they say one habit is, this, is the hero habit, and that is to make your bed every morning. No matter what, no matter how you're feeling in the morning, good, bad, productive, unproductive, anxious, or, or excited, make your bed the first thing every morning. This is one task that each of us can accomplish in less than a minute. And because you do that, that, accomplish feel, that accomplishing feeling at the start of the day sets yourself up for productivity. So to conclude about habit building and habit formation, it's all about a healthy balance between motivation and discipline. Like I said, nobody can be motivated all the time. When you're motivated, you know you'll, you'll, you'll kill it. But on days when your motivation is not with you, because you have built your habits, discipline is your best friend. That will come in and take the place of motivation. So with that, let's move on to a little bit more about the mindset and approach and the kind of thought process you should have for learning effectively. Um, how many of you have heard about this, the fixed mindset and growth mindset? I, I think it's a very popular concept. So they say that a growth mindset is oh, quite a lot of you, great. So they say that the growth mindset is what you really need to be able to learn effectively. So here's the differences. Somebody with a fixed mindset believe that intelligence is static. It's something that you are either born with or not born with, and it cannot be developed. And if you're trying to develop it, you probably want to look smart, but those who have growth mindset believe that intelligence is like a muscle. You can grow it. And it's important to have a desire to learn as you go ahead in life. In fixed mindset, people avoid challenges. Growth mindset challenges are the most welcome thing. Um, fixed mindset, they give up easily. Growth mindset, will because they embrace the challenges, they won't give up. Um, fixed mindset, people, whenever they see a challenge, they always try to calculate the effort that will go into it. And the moment they see it's a lot of effort, they're like, no, that's not for me, not fruitful. Whereas growth mindset people always look as effort as a path to mastery. And in that effort, they look for feedback. They try to learn from others. Whereas fixed mindset folks, if you give them uh, feedback, they feel threatened. They feel like um, uh, you are saying something bad to them. They feel threatened by others' success also. But in growth mindset, people are inspired by others' success. They want to be like uh, their role models. So your brain responds to, um, it's kind of like exercise. So just like if you start doing strength training today, you know what happens? Um, first, your muscles break down because you're trying to do something totally new that your body is not used to. But then your muscle protein builds up again with much more strength to, to tackle that challenge that you gave to, it, to your body in the first place. It's the exact same thing that happens with the brain. When you try to challenge it, to learn something new, to try a new challenge, 
at first it will break down. It, you will maybe get a headache or you'll feel like I am not getting this, but you have to keep at it because then your neurons will connect. Uh, you will get a flow of hormones into your brain. And it's the exact same thing that happens in muscle building. And one really easy tip to start getting into a growth mindset is that for any negative words, for example, if I'm saying, I haven't been able to uh, run for five kilometers uh, at, at a go. Instead of saying I cannot or I have not, try to add yet to it. I haven't yet ran for five kilometers. And then you'll say you automatically have the urge to say, but I will try, but I will get there, but I will learn. So just adding that one word to your language will really help yourself to get into a growth mindset. Another uh, area around mindset uh, or more of psychology, and this really happens in while learning, is whether you're in a focused thinking approach or a diffuse thinking approach. While in fixed mindset and growth mindset, growth mindset was a clear winner. Here, there's no exactly exact winner. Both are required. So focus thinking is something you need for deep work. So when let's say you are really at a very complex task that is going to take one, two, three hours, you really need to be in that deep work focused phase where you are targeted towards that one problem and you are thinking with a tactical approach and you don't want to think about anything else at that time. But in other times, depending on the challenge at hand, you will see focus thinking doesn't work. Uh, often it happens, even when you're doing focused thinking, you reach a point where you can't solve the problem anymore. But then you go for a shower or you go for a walk or you just to go to play with your pet and suddenly the answer comes to you. That's diffuse thinking, where the thing is still in the back of your mind, but you're not forcing yourself to narrow down it. You're thinking about more things at a time. And that's when strategy uncovers itself. So based on the type of learning you are doing, you will always have to understand is focused thinking right for me or is diffuse thinking right for me? So I have been talking for quite some time now. I'll try and do this quick activity with you. Um, and this is to see if you can go with focus thinking or diffuse thinking. Can Please feel free to put in the chat. What do you think are the three errors in this sentence? Laura, do you have a question? No, I think I know one of them. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, it's uh, three, I think. It's uh, triple E, one of them. Yeah, there's uh, extra E. And, and yeah, yeah, this is double S. It's yeah, two. this is the other error. So we have an answer from Elsa. <laughs> so S is for this, E for three. So there's an extra S, an extra E. But the third error is that there are only two errors. There are actually not three errors. So the meaning of the sentence itself is the error. So this is what is the difference between focused thinking and diffuse thinking. So when I really tell you to look into uh, this sentence, I give you a challenge at hand, so you started focusing on it. And most of you, those who really focused on it will of course get those first two answered. But the third one happens only when you let go, take a back seat and look at it. That's when you catch the third error. So that's the answer to that. There's no clear winner in between focused thinking and diffuse thinking, but you need to know the uh, when which one is required. Yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we look at that towards the end. Um, so to close out on learning, there's some few more points like, don't forget that the brain needs rest. Sleep is essential in learning. Uh, you can't learn uh, all the time and not give yourself some rest. So going with the exercise example again, if you're doing strength training, but you don't take at least two days of rest in the week, your muscles will not develop. Um, you will not get fit. 
So just like that, make sure you really prioritize sleep and give your brain the rest that it needs. Uh, another approach is while learning, think about chunking and recalling. So depending on the topic that you're learning, try to chunkify the information into meaningful groups. And while you're doing that, also think about recalling. So don't, don't try to just reread the thing again and again. But while you're reading it, while you're watching those videos, while you're doing those assignments, try to recall what you are learning. So as you do that going through it, you're pushing your brain to think in different directions. One is to group information and the other is to retain information. So when you do this, you really um, develop your learning journey. Some other approaches are for heavy tasks, uh, try deep work and deep rest. So a lot of people say that for your routine, you know, 1 to 2 p.m. do this and then 2 to 3 p.m. do this and do like a one hour routine. But you will find if the tasks are really heavy, it's really difficult to context switch one after the other. So for heavy tasks like that, it said, go into deep work. So let's say Thursday is your deep work day. Just dive into it, focus on that big task. And then deep rest means don't think about that for another three days. Take complete rest from that task. So that really helps for heavy tasks. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the Pomodoro technique, which applies to similar, it could be applied to heavy tasks or small tasks. And it's kind of like, I know I'm going with a lot of exercise examples, but like high, inter, uh, high interval intensity training, where you do an exercise for eight reps, 10 reps, and then you take 10 seconds of rest. And then you again repeat it for eight reps, 10 reps, and then you take 10 seconds of rest. Similarly, they say that set a timer of 25 minutes and focus on the task. After 25 minutes, take a five minute break. Don't think about the task. Then again, set a 25 minute timer. This is what's the Pomodoro technique. Um, when it's about deep focus sessions, uh, they say that music really helps activate your brain. And by that, I mean the right kind of music. And for everyone that's different, you need to identify what works for you. Some people really like to listen to Mozart and they get into a deep focus space. Some people like to listen to psychedelic music or piano. Uh, it depends on what you like, but see what really helps your brain to get into deep focus. And after a deep focus session, find what helps you meditate. And by meditate, I don't always mean the mindfulness practice of meditation. That works for some people. It doesn't work for some others. But there are different practices that help you get into a meditative state. So it's very important that you identify that whole thing about joy, calm, and focus so that you can dive yourself into a deep focus session and come out from a deep focus session. Also, it's very important to learn on the go, uh, like I said, by running, listen to podcasts, audiobooks, and most importantly, <laughs> don't forget to take care of your eyes. Take a break from the screen if you're learning endlessly remotely. Some other important things about learning are learning in a community. Um, I know that when you're learning remotely, it can get really isolated, but they say that learning is more uh, productive if done in a community. And there are different ways to do that. One is to find a mentor. So jump into LinkedIn or any other platform and find somebody who is an expert at what you are learning and just cold email them, send them a message. Here's who I am and here's what I'm learning. And I really like your profile. Would you like to be my mentor? Maybe five, six, seven out of 10 people will not reply but you don't know, maybe one, two, three people will reply to you and you'll find a mentor who wants to be your friend and help you. And it doesn't always have to be a LinkedIn. If, if you can search, you will find there are a lot of mentorship platforms out there as well. The reverse of it is try to be a mentor to someone else. It's called the protege effect. If you're learning something, teach it to someone else. They say when you're teaching someone else, that's the best way to absorb your own learning. Or join an online community of people similar to you who are trying to learn what you are learning. Uh, to weekly meetups, look for online courses that have a peer review system so that you have that practice of uh, uh, community learning. And finally, let future you learn from present you, which means write blog posts or journal entries for yourself. You're learning something today that you might forget tomorrow. But if you write something for yourself today, future you will thank present you. And thank you for writing this for me. To close out on learning, and then we'll spend just a few minutes on working in a remote space. 
uh, I want to talk about this, the nine types of intelligence. Um, I know you all have something in your mind about what you want to learn and nobody should come and tell you what you should learn. But if you are an enthusiastic learner, think about the different types of intelligence that human beings have. And they say that if you try to dabble in all of these areas or as many of these areas as possible, you're really pushing your brain to do something different and helping grow that extra thing. So let's say you are some you are somebody who's already a logically intelligent person because of your profession. Try something that involves musical intelligence or kinesthetic intelligence. Uh, there are different approaches to go about it. I won't go too much detail into that. But if you try to push your brain in different areas of intelligence, you will see that um, there's something happening. You're really learning. You're really growing. So with that, coming to the closing parts, and that is productivity when working remotely. Um, I don't need to repeat that whatever I said for learning remotely, setting up your workspace, your digital space, all of that applies to working remotely as well. But some other things about maximizing productivity when you're working remotely is try to plan at the start of the week using a bullet journal or any other planning method for what your week's going to look like. But don't be an over planner. Leave some room for spontaneity because your colleagues might need something from you or there might be something that comes up. Those who try to over plan get really annoyed when their colleagues need something else from them that was not a part of the plan. So that's why plan, but leave room for spontaneity. Also in remote working, you'll see you are switching between sync and async work. So sync work is when you're actually in a Zoom meeting, working with your colleagues versus async work is where you're working on something separately and you will get back to your colleagues later. So it's very important to maintain a healthy balance between sync and async work. Um, I think I already mentioned that block at least one day in a week for deep learning or deep work. Also, when working with your colleagues and especially when remotely, don't hesitate to over communicate. When we were in the office with each other, we could just tap in on uh, the shoulder and ask a question and, and we know you're there and I can ask you a question and I can find out. But in a remote space, there's always chance that you heard someone wrong or you didn't get something right. So don't hesitate to over communicate. Nobody gets annoyed. It's, it's rather welcome. Then there's the 80-20 rule. Uh, people say that sometimes 80% of the outcomes can come from 20% of the inputs. So for example, let's say you have a big presentation and of course it's very important to make that presentation well. But if I didn't take five minutes to, to send the agenda to the attendees or inform them what time the presentation is at, it doesn't matter how great of a presentation I made. So that means that 20% of your work will actually give 80% of the outcomes. And even if your presentation wasn't great, if you were super punctual and super accurate about the agenda, people will still enjoy it. So try to find the 80-20 balance in the work that you do. And while doing that, uh, what I'm trying to touch on is that done is better than perfect. Don't try to be a perfectionist. Always try to get the task done rather than getting it perfected. Another very important thing is, and I, this is really a tough one, we let work define ourselves. We be, let work become who we are, but you cannot, you should not let work consume you. Being productive is not equal to being busy. I would say the people who get stuff done and still have enough time to do something for themselves are the actual productive people versus those who are just busy, busy. Um, stress is normal but it's very important that you identify what stresses you out and you recalibrate and care for yourself. Predict burnout. You should know that if here's a new project and this is the timeline and these are the requirements, this is not doable. I'm going to get burned out. So predict that and course correct to avoid it. Um, another very important thing is, and I'm sure this happens to everyone, it, it happens to me pretty much every day, is even after the end of the work day, I can't stop thinking about work. It's called the Zygarnik effect. But they say that it's very important to not let that happen to you. And the best way to do that is, of course, you're not going to be able to finish all the work in one day. But it's very important that at the end of the day, you really brain dump of what has been done and what needs to be done tomorrow. The moment you do that brain dump, you'll find it's very easy to disconnect and not let this effect take over you. 
it's also important that you don't do only work but spend time doing something else which is not at all related to your work but also brings you equal joy and we've already talked about how important sleep is and last but not the least celebrate your learning and work journey uh, your work is going to occupy the majority of your adult life right so it's really important that you celebrate it you must reward yourself when you accomplish a milestone when you finish that uh, tough course that you are working on do something for yourself that you enjoy be your own friend there and share your joy with your friends tell them what you accomplished and tell them how how great you are feeling um things will always not go great sometimes there will be failure and it's very important to be cool with failure and not let it take over you in fact they say that a great a great failure is much better than a mediocre success so sometimes failure is more important actually and finally uh, most importantly don't take yourself too seriously um we try to think about work so much that it becomes everything but end of the day we are just tiny little human beings on this huge planet in a huge universe don't take it too seriously the problems are figure outable if something can't be done today you'll figure it out tomorrow so with that i come to the end of my presentation uh this is just a resource drop section and we will be sharing the slides with you so that you can take a look at these try out some of these apps watch these videos or read these books i hope it will be helpful for you it's mostly some of the terms and things that i've mentioned in the presentation